It's time for the Daily Planet Podcast Show. So sit back, relax, and give us a go. Scott and Matt and maybe a guest. Undertaking an epic pod quest. We're gonna ramble a lot about movies and books and television and directors and film festivals and this really long list of stuff that I know nothing about, but they gave it to me and they really wanted me to read through it. And that's all I can really say about it, but it's gonna be great. Show. Hello and welcome to the Daily Planet Podcast, your weekly podcast for all things movies, TV, books, and anything else we feel like talking about. I am your host, Scott Daly, and I'm joined once again this week by my co-host, Michael. Michael, welcome back to the show. Oh, uh, hey, you buddy. How's Thanks it going, man? Me. Happy New Year. Well, Happy New Year to you, too. Also joining us this week is, is my wife, once again. <laughs> Oh my God. Isn't that perfect? Yes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's wonderful. I hope you don't you can, get copyrighted. You can turn it off now. It can we all finished. have it? Okay, there you go. Can we all have the music? I mean, I guess we have to now. Yeah, at least... I hope you don't get in trouble for that. But if you do, it was worth it. I, I suppose so. At least... You, hello. Hello. We did it for the um for legitimate critique purposes. Yes. They'll still, I, that they'll still song flag was it. good. Yeah, it was. I enjoyed it. <laughs> I think uh, it has good quality. Yeah, after your, your guest appearance on the uh, uh, Disaster Artist episode, Elise, you are back. Mm-hmm. This is a little weird back because again. Elise and I are in the same room, but we're not facing each other. <laughs> so it's a little different. It's okay. It's for the best. Is it? Is it yeah, for the best? it is. Guys, we are here today to talk about 2017. We're talking about all of our favorite movies. Uh, we've each collected our, our top five lists, and they are... Uh, pretty pretty different from each other some of us have very very unusual top five lists are you talking about me or are you talking about oh michael's right yes okay of course we're talking about michael <laughs> it was difficult for me to find five movies that i could recommend from this year which which that's is not but but it's actually probably more than most years which is this was more a, difficult or you found more movies you liked more movies i liked ah, i actually felt see, like a lot of good. movies i liked this year which was like you know, this was, I think, fine. I think a very good year for film. Um, there were a lot of very, very good movies created this year. Um, and getting mine down to my top 10 was really hard. Let me tell you, he had a really difficult time. <laughs> oh, How am I going to get my top 10? And now he has to get it down to five and then he has to number the top five. I did it. Oh, though. It's like choosing your favorite child. I know. It's a good thing. He has a favorite dog. Wait, doesn't what? have to have a kid. <laughs> we all know that you like ghosts more than Maggie. Yeah, because Maggie's gross. Maggie's That's, cute. Confirm that. Yeah. <laughs> Michael was over at our house over the, the break and got got firsthand confirmation of how gross Maggie is. Everybody farts. farts. <laughs> it's okay. Everybody does it. Girls yeah, do it. Maggie does boys more. do it. Well, Maggie has a little tiny system. <laughs> Right? So it shouldn't smell Don't as Don't babies bad. fart more? Babies fart and it stinks, right? I don't know. I don't know either. Anyway, um, so yeah, we're going to talk about our, our top five movies of the year. We're going to go through those and talk about them a little bit, talk about why we liked them so much. Then we're going to do our second annual Golden Planet Awards, which are really just when I pick things that I like. What else is new? Thank right? you. Yeah. Um, and then uh, then we're going to wrap this whole thing up and we're going to say goodbye to 2017 and hello to 2018. Hopefully another great year of cinema. We will see. Michael will probably hate all of it because you're I'm Michael. optimistic. I bet all the movies that come out this year are going to be good. We have that wow. recorded can we, now. Yeah, can we, I'm gonna so <laughs> we can always play that back if needed. You have to be optimistic about these things. I, I agree. I think movies are are enjoyable. And there's yeah. some bad ones. But you know what? Star Wars The Last Jedi. I, we're not getting into that. We are not getting into that. You know, you <laughs> did bring both myself and Michael on here. And so we get to talk about Star Wars if we want to. No, you don't. Yes, we will. Anyway, let's let's talk some news. This is Daily Planet News. I don't know, I don't like I didn't want to go. Oh, Beyonce! You didn't give me time to look up her stuff. 
<laughs> Wait, what happened with Beyonce? No, Michael, exactly. do not encourage her. Everybody wants to know about Beyonce. <laughs> what, what, what happened? Well, I don't know. I haven't found her stuff right now, but I'm sure there's something really good. Beyonce and Jay Z, they've always got something going on. So, uh, the thing I wanted to talk about this year in news is not any specific stories. I just wanted to talk about uh, 2017 at the box office because. Oh, they're openly seen the first time after five months. Okay, Elise, stop it. Where have they been, though? Oh, you know, the. They do that whole thing about, you know, like celebrities don't show their kids for the first little bit because, no, pictures, please, because they're going to sell the pictures for money and then they want to be able to control where the money goes. It's just I see. I see. total logistics. Part of the thing about being famous. So, um, see, if Scott can't see me right now, it's really easy. To, he's going to get mad. So I'm going to let him talk. So. The- <laughs> <laughs> Scott, you were talking about movies. Yeah, yeah. This is what this podcast is about. Beyonce hasn't that. been in a movie in a long time. She's in one uh, um, next year. Wasn't she? Oh, in, what is uh, she in? Showgirls or something? She was in Dreamgirls. Dreamgirls. Yeah. That's right. I can't remember what she's going to be in next year. She was in Austin Powers that one time. This is beast besides the point. I'm mm. not being sucked into this whole. Um, you started looking it up. I did. The. <laughs> Uh, the box office this year was a 2.8% increase over last year, um, which is good, but overall ticket sales are down. Um, and the summer, the summer was the worst summer in like a decade. So really the reason the box office was plus this year was just because of Star Wars at the end of the year, which was huge as always. Cause it's, well, it's Star Wars. Um, but it's Michael, it's not looking good for going to the theater. That's unfortunate. Why? Why do you think that is? Is it because of streaming? Yeah, movies online. Yeah. Streaming, ticket prices, everything. People don't leave their house as much. At I least think it's to because um, AMC is not going to have their curtains anymore. I I, I agree. I agree. It's called masking, and I agree. Right. Although masked. we went to an AMC over the break because we got gift masked. cards, and they, they did. did. They did. They masked. I couldn't believe it. But um, yeah, so the the top ten movies. Uh, domestically as far as box office goes number one unsurprisingly even though it only showed up in the last three weeks of the year is star wars the last jedi at 533 million dollars recount please what there's nothing what i think we need to recount it's you don't you don't think fake news I i think this whole list goes to show that the only thing that mattered for box office sales was um advertising and hype rather than the quality of the film ah that's a good point there michael I yeah. mean, I mean, look at all the films on this list. I don't know, all Michael. These like, movies got massive hype trains. Well, of course, like, Justice League. Do you think Justice League deserves its spot at number no. ten? There, that was just people hoping that it would have been something good. After I don't, like, Woman. like you guys are like acting like you've broken news <laughs> that that large blockbuster movies <laughs> are in the top ten. This is nothing. This is nothing new that the large blockbuster. You don't believe this. You know the- so, so number two is Beauty and the Beast, the remake. Um, number three is Wonder Woman, a rather good movie. Uh, that one was good. Massive hype train. I cried. What is what does massive hype train mean, Michael? I what, just I- really want to kind of keep going along these lines. <laughs> <laughs> number four is Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Two, a, a good movie. Hmm. Five is Spider Man so. Homecoming, uh, a movie. It was good. I liked it. Uh, Three hundred and thirty four million for that. Uh, number six was It, the shocking smash hit that no one expected. The highest grossing uh, horror movie ever. Um, number seven was Thor Ragnarok with $311 million. Uh, number eight was Despicable Me 3, $264 million. Not Not too surprising there. Um, number nine is Logan. I'm surprised not to see that on your list, Michael, but Logan at, at $226 million. I thought about it. <clears throat> um, so, so Coco's not on the list, though. No, no. Do you um do you know where it was in relation to like Despicable Me Me three? Why was uh, why Coco was is Pixar? currently number fourteen on the list at one hundred. Despicable Me three has minions in it. Yeah, they, and the, kids the, love they, minions. Yeah, for some reason. Yeah, because the Pixar movie is usually on this list. It I mean, is besides the dinosaur. It is. It is. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's Coco is number fourteen. Um. It was released near the end of the year, so maybe... I think it's still in theater, so 
if it had more time, maybe it would have eventually gotten up there. But I think the word just got out that there was that thirty minute frozen thing in front of it, and people were like, "I don't want to go see." They it. stopped so, doing that. Yeah, did they, they finally? Because that, yeah. if I had known that, I might not have gone. The 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 news here, Michael, that's relevant to you is number thirteen on this list is Jumanji: Welcome to the Jungle at wow. one hundred eighty five million, uh, with only ten days released before the end of the year. It's pretty good. It has. A chance. Yeah, it's, it's the rock to pass Justice League, which I think it could do it. It's it's probably going to do it, which is insane. Good, good, should. Um, that's I mean that's a disaster for Warner Brothers. Absolute disaster. They deserve it. They're still Disney should profits. rule the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're trying to get a sponsorship. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, yeah, but I mean, I think it's kind of crazy. You look at this list and how see how many. How many are owned by Disney? Disney has four films on this list. Um, but now that they've bought Fox, five five of the top ten are Disney films. Pretty soon, we'll all be owned by Disney. And technically, like Spider-Man Homecoming. Aren't the was... top five men now? Are they not? Maybe no, I'm Wonder not. Woman is not. Oh, not yeah. Disney. Yeah. Forgot about that Wonder Woman there. Yeah, so an interesting year at the box office, I think. We're seeing continuing trends. Um, people are not going to the movies as much. The ticket sales numbers continue to go down and down and down, but um, there's still money to be made, and Star Wars continues to be that that huge pull, although we are seeing that trend downwards. Uh, Star Wars movies are not a big deal anymore. They're not an event, so they don't carry like... the box office weight that they did. The next, yeah. one, the ninth one will, though, because it's the end of the that third you it know might i, I, I think know. that it would i think it's gonna i mean be fine. the force awakens made two billion dollars um i don't think any any disney-owned star wars movie will make that much money because that was like star wars is back event everyone saw that movie i don't right. think any more films will have that kind of draw it's all downhill from here yeah we shall see but they're still gonna i mean as we saw if they get enough of that hype trade maybe they will what so yeah the choo -choo hype, hype. I get on you. the hype i hate, I hate you i hate you both I hate you anyway let's let's jump out of news that's all i w really wanted to talk about we'll be back next week with some actual news stories um let's get into our top fives let's talk about the movies we loved in 2017 the way we're going to do this is each of us are just going to talk about our five and then four and then three etc um so michael why don't we start with you what was your fifth best film of 2017 well my fifth best film um I thought a lot about and one of the ones like you suggested was um, I was thinking about Logan because they did something different with the superhero genre, which I'm the enemy of. Um, <laughs> however, um, my fifth movie is still a superhero movie because it's Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Wow. Wow. Yes. Michael. You're... Yes. A mainstream superhero movie. I can't believe it. I know. So what what, what, what was it about Guardians 2 that got you over <laughs> the I hate superhero movie hump? Yeah, well, the thing that impressed me about it, I mean, it's not like a movie that's going to live long in my memory or anything, but um, it was Gar Guardians of the Galaxy has its own sort of unique um, tone, which is which is well balanced in that it's it's very amusing, but it still hits its serious notes effectively. Um, but but the, the big thing about Guardians of the Galaxy 2 that surprised me is that it's a sequel to a superhero movie. And it still ended up being good because that <laughs> that never happens. Like the origin story of superhero movies has kind of, has kind of like the arc built for itself. And you can you can do that competently without having to have a, a really, you know, great story. But sequels are really hard to do for superheroes. And I think they they did it well in a way that didn't seem like they were just doing it for the sequel, but that it had its own story to tell. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I really enjoyed this movie. It, it just missed my top 10. But um, I, the, the first movie is about a family coming together. And this movie is about what happens after that. Like his family is hard and you fight and you argue and you are destructive. And I loved I loved that. I loved the exploration of fatherhood in this movie. It's I think it's a beautiful story. Um, and it was a great movie. The music was just as good as the first one. Uh, some of the some of the action set pieces was standard, a little bit too much Marvel stuff, but 
yeah, I think, um, yeah, they, they managed to, to keep a con- sort of tie in the theme of this one with the first one, because this is still about, um, family, um, being, you know, the, the people who are around you rather than your, your biological family, which is kind of the angle this took yeah. on it. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, it was just a well, well-crafted story. The characters are still, um, appealing. Um, they didn't, they didn't go too crazy with like the baby Groot thing. Which was stuff like that. adorable <laughs> at the very beginning. I think that might've been maybe my favorite part. The opening, I mean, not really, but maybe. I thought the opening was a great it statement. Was fantastic. Yeah. So you liked, yeah. you liked Guardians 2 as well, at least? I did. I liked it a lot. I liked the music. Yeah. At least yeah. as a, yeah. a music person. So it's a, it's a, it's a yeah. good style that they kind of fell upon. I don't know if that has any ties to the um, comic or, or I whatever. I don't think so. I think that's all just that's what James Gunn wanted to do. Yeah, that was a good it was a good choice to make it um, more interesting from a filmmaking perspective. Yeah, I agree. I agree. All right, Elise, what is your number five? My number five. First of all, I had a really hard time figuring out what I wanted to do for my whole list. And then I thought about just putting them all in a random, a random number generator because I didn't know what order to put them in. And Scott got really mad at me for <laughs> even <laughs> saying that I would do that randomly. You can't do that randomly. No. It's so, a countdown. Yeah. But my number five is a movie called Landline. And we saw it recently on Amazon because it was just on their streaming service. And I'd seen it advertised. And I am I'm pretty sure it came out this year over the summer. Like, I had did. to look it yeah. up. I thought it came out. Oh, so, anyways, I'd wanted to see it. And we couldn't go see it because we were out of the country and then came back and it. I'd forgotten about it or maybe it wasn't here anymore. But anyways, it has... Um, these two sisters that um, are going through obviously different things. Uh, The oldest one is engaged and is kind of questioning her engagement. And then the younger sister finds out that her dad is having an affair. And so it's the younger sister going to the older one who is supposed to be able to help her through this life situation because you generally go to your older sibling if you need any sort of like help or counselor or whatever. And the older sister is just pretty much about as screwed up as the dad is. And so it's interesting (laughs) because you see the sister that's older trying to help the younger one deal with the situation. And she's the older sister's understanding what her dad's going through because that's the exact same thing she's going through. And so I enjoyed it. I liked the actresses in it. I liked the style of the movie and I liked the movie because it was about sisters and it made me think about my sisters and I was going through my list and I feel like most of the movies that I have, it's because I can make a connection to a character that I liked or it just was a pretty statement movie. And yeah. I was like, Oh, that's a good one. But anyway, that's why I liked landline. Yeah. It was good. It, it takes place in 1995. Um, oh yeah. Which so is, it was like good nineties throwback, but it wasn't like, it wasn't like, nostalgia like they they didn't set it in 95 to tap into any kind of demand for nostalgia it was just this is where they wanted to set the story and um the the title makes sense when you know it was 1995 because they had landlines still mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's, it's a kind of a double meaning title it has jenny slate in it who uh is really great i love jenny slate uh, this was directed and written by uh, jillian robespierre uh, who also directed obvious child a couple years ago and wrote, which was really I think. good. Yeah, which is about a woman uh, dealing with with having an abortion. Um, yeah, I, I like this movie a lot too. Um, it's on it's on Prime Video, Michael. If, if you want to check it out, you don't even have to pay to see it. No, just unless you it. have yeah. Amazon Prime, and then I guess you kind of had to pay. Yeah, I, I, I missed this one. Yeah, it, it was one of these uh, one of these tiny movies that it does hit the theater, but very very briefly, and then it's gone. Yeah, yeah, it's just some a, good movies like that. I guess I, I suspect sad. I wouldn't relate with the sister concept as well as i don't have as positive of sister experiences as you no yeah i mean i think there's parts of it that you would not but there's parts of it that you would i mean they have a complicated <laughs> relationship so what's his name tutero's in it yeah he uh, was john tutero yeah i liked him who's, who's john tutero uh um, i think of him from the night of 
Did you see the night of? I yeah, didn't. I mean, he was in Barton Fink. Oh, oh brother, where art thou? Oh, I saw Oh, brother, where art thou? It's a good movie. He's he's in all kinds of things, Michael. You would recognize him if you saw him. Hmm. Okay. Um. All right. Now, my number five is a movie called Call Me by Your Name. This is a uh. This is set in the eighties. Um. It's about a. Uh, it's a summer love story between a. Seven is he seventeen, Elise? He's seventeen. Yeah. Yeah. yeah seventeen year old boy. He's underage. Yeah, he is underage. Mm-hmm. Well, the age of consent in Italy is is fourteen, so he's technically Oh well Yeah. Those um, Italians. But, <laughs> different lifestyle they live. Anyway, um it's a love story between him and a, a Army Hammer, um, who is a twenty four year old that's uh, staying with his parents at their summer home in Italy during an internship. Um it is this it's it's directed by Luca Guadagino. I think that's how you say his name. Um, Timothy Chalamet plays uh, the 17 year old kid. And I like, this is one of those movies that I kept hearing like really, really great things about. And I was like, I went into it a little hesitantly because I think like there's like, there's a chance, like whenever there's like a story about two gay people going through a, a, a romance like this, you think like there's, there's being propped up because this is, an important story that we want people to hear. So maybe we're being less critical and we're just propping it up because it's important that we tell these kind of stories. Um, but I was kind of blown away by this film. I think the music is absolutely beautiful. I think the story between these two characters is so like, it's a very like beautiful, quiet type of slow rolling movie that like builds up their romance slowly over the course of the summer. Like, and, and it's filmed as in uh, the summer in Italy is like this, secret garden where anything could happen and it's just this beautiful beautiful love story um i think the actors are wonderful i really think everyone should give this this film a shot at least you saw this one with me i did i i thought it was good i obviously did not put it in my top five didn't even put it on my top 10 (laughs) um i thought it was good i think the timothy guy he was fantastic and he was also in Lady Bird, which I know we're going to talk about a little bit later. So he's for, I guess he's fairly new. I haven't seen him in anything else before that, but had a good year. Um, mm-hmm. I agree. The music was beautiful. And I think that that was partially because thinking about the main character, he was a kid who studied music and he would like always be transcribing music. And so that was something that just to the character itself, they, I guess, considered to be something they wanted to make sure they put i don't know a lot of time whatever it was good <laughs> Stephen stevens was good yeah uh yeah. He, i don't know if those were original songs or not but they were both I believe they were yeah. absolutely beautiful i hope that they're nominated for an oscar um i i mean acting was good beautiful movie yeah. it's just it I, my- I i get why people would want to encourage you to go see it what do you think of the the backlash related to the fact that he's technically an underage kid um and army hammer is an adult i find it very interesting that no one is talking about it i think people are well Um, i don't hear anything about it (laughs) and i guess i don't hear anything about it because i'm not reading as much about it as you um i don't see it anywhere like i don't see this movie getting a backlash for having that same sort of age dynamic relationship as some of the other movies that have come out. And I, I find that to be very interesting. Um, I mean, it didn't seem in the movie to be like that big of an age difference. Yeah. And so I think that the, the, the problem is like Timothy Chalamet is a tiny man. (laughs) He's like very small. Um, I think he's in his 20s, uh, like the actor, but he is very, very tiny. He's very smallly built. So the movie starts out and he looks he looks so much younger than Army Hammer. But I think as the movie goes along, you you see he has a real sense of maturity to him in some areas. Um, he, he very much kind of knows who he is. He's just dealing with these feelings that he's having um, and that he's not sure what to do with. Um so I, I think that's why it's not as I, I, it doesn't bother me, I guess. 
Yeah, I don't think just because something is featured in a movie, it means that that movie is endorsing that that thing. I, I don't, I don't, I don't really get offended by by things in movies because just because something appears in a movie doesn't mean the movie's endorsing it. You know. Yeah, and I think this is a very specific relationship between two people. This is not, yeah, this is not an endorsement of underage kid relationship with adult man. Like, absolutely not. This is just some. This is a connection between these two characters that is very deep and long unfolding and and beautiful. I, I really, I really liked it. I guess I wonder if it also doesn't bother you as much in the end because the parents were completely on board with it. Yeah, I guess that's And the true. whole movie, you know, like, it seems to be the parents were aware and encouraging and then at the end the dad gave him that yeah. wonderful speech about you know Ugh. like being who you are and understanding and all of that and he was never upset about right who he had chosen yeah to explore that with yeah that, that father who's played by michael stuhlbarg who will be on my list again <laughs> before we're done um, but oh, yeah. I, I, I was liking this movie until his final speech. He gives this beautiful monologue at the end of the film that just like knocked me out of my chair. It, it's, it's so wonderful. It's such an amazing performance. And I think, I think it's worth the price of admission for that monologue alone, but the movie surrounding that scene is, is just as beautiful. And I, I really liked it. So that's call me by your name. It's in theaters now limited release, I believe. All right, let's go to number fours. Michael, what is your number four? All right, my number four movie, uh, and I apologize if I'm I'm too much of a film snob, um, (laughs) is Jumanji, (laughs) Welcome to the Jungle. Oh, my gosh. Oh, God. Film, it's just a cinephile. Your tastes are too refined, Michael. I know. It's just, just, I just want to have the same opinions as as everyone else. (laughs) I get that. That's why. (laughs) No, I mean, I, 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 we all saw this movie together when you, when you were in, in Dallas. Yes. Uh, I think that's why Christmas he liked break. it so much. Yeah. yeah it was the company. Well, I, I will, I, I, I have thought of that. Um, because when I watch comedies with you in particular, I always enjoy them more because you laugh out loud. <laughs> and if I watch comedy movies by myself, um, then I, I just won't laugh generally. Okay. Um, but a lot of comedy is like, I mean, a lot of laughter is like contagious and so forth. No, right? I, so, I completely agree so, that the watching it, it definitely matters who you watch comedies with. I completely That's agree. True. But, but that being said, um, Jumanji was like a. I, I I think comedies are very very difficult to get right, mm-hmm. and I also think that they're generally way underappreciated critically compared to dramas. Um, and I'm really tired of all of these Oscar chasing, you know, biopics and and so forth. Um, that are just so melodramatic and 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 I find them generally quite empty. Um, but Jumanji took a lot of of skill to to make for a number of reasons. It had a lot going against it, at least from my vantage point, because um, I hate remakes. I don't think they should do remakes. And this seemed like the most stupid and unnecessary remake you could do because I don't even remember anyone being that fond of the original Jumanji. It's just kind of like, oh, remember in the nineties when Robin Williams was in movies and remember how much <laughs> Aww. Them? Um moment of silence. Rest in peace, Robin Williams. <laughs> um but uh but that wasn't really a movie that needed to be remade. And they kind of didn't remake it. I mean this was a completely different movie. Um which was good. That's the correct way to do a movie like this. Is, is not to just do the same movie with new actors, but to have a completely different story. Um, this movie was more about uh, a group of, of, it was more like a breakfast club. Um, yeah. It was like a group of, of, I mean, it was almost exactly breakfast club, actually. It was about four like very different people who were thrown into detention, and then they're thrown into a video game and they have to survive together and work together and become friends and so forth. Um, which is a, which is a good shell for a movie. All of the characters will, were, were, were well explored and likable, even if you couldn't really relate to them. And, um, and I just liked how the, the video game was set up into the different levels. Um, none of the comedy was too, um, non, non sequitur which is which is what I'm often afraid of with modern comedies is they just have like s- sort of random things that you're supposed to find funny. 
Yeah. I, Whereas I know most what you mean. Of the humor was related to the what was going on in the in the film. Um, so yeah, I just I thought I thought there were a lot of things that were appreciated about it, and I didn't think that anyone else would bring it up. So I wanted it to be on the list. <laughs> no, I, I think that's that's great uh, because I this movie should not have been good, and I thought it was, and I think that's the greatest endorsement you can give it. Like, like right. who would have ever thought this movie would have turned out good? Yeah. And it was it was it was um it was a good showcase of of acting for some of the characters as well like yeah. the rock I mean the uh, rock <laughs> yeah like he's quite likable anyway <laughs> and it's fun to see him pretending to be a nerd um, <laughs> Jack so, Black pretending to be a girl that was well done too that I, I was that a was little fantastic bit of that. I, I thought it might just be kind of his like kind of gross humor that he does sometimes but he actually um. It was very tasteful. He, he, it was tasteful and it was it was it was subtle. Like he didn't go way over the top with it. Yeah, like th- his character Bethany playing a woman stuck in the body of a, a overweight forty year old man had a lot of pathos to it, which is ridiculous. <laughs> like it's ridiculous. <laughs> I like that you use that word to describe that <laughs> performance. It's, it's he has true. daughters. It's true, and maybe that's why he understands the teenage. Maybe. He's I, got kids. Maybe he has daughters, and that's. Yeah. I, I think that that might be it. And I, he gets I, the women like, on it a good level. Karen Gillan is great in everything she's in, and she's in this movie, and she's really good in it too. Yeah, so she's just, it's just a good, good movie. I think she needs to work on her well hair done. flip. Though. Never thought I would be talking about that movie on this list, but I'm I'm happy you did it. Thank you. All right, number four, Elise. So. I really didn't know what this movie was until you made me watch the trailer. I'm sorry. And I really, I'm glad that you showed it to me because I had to look, once I knew who wrote it and directed it, I was like, oh my gosh, I really like this person. And so because I liked Hell or High Water and Sicario, I was like, of course, I will like Wind River. And I did. It was beautiful. And I know Michael doesn't like this movie. I don't think. Isn't that right? I think Scott told me that you didn't like it. Yeah, he hates it. Well, I'm smarter than you and I get to go after you. So (laughs) there we go. (laughs) Anyways, um, it was absolutely beautiful. Um, I'm really glad that I saw it in a theater because I think that there are some movies that are worth seeing it in a theater and then there are some movies that it's okay if you see it on Amazon Prime. And this was definitely one that you would want to see in a theater. Um, I liked the storyline. I thought Elizabeth Olsen did a really good job. I thought she, um, is a lot different than her other sisters and has come so far. She's the best Olsen. She is the best Olsen. I will say I was not as impressed with Jeremy Renner in it. I don't know why. If there's anything that I could take and change about this movie, it would be Jeremy Renner because he just (laughs) didn't sell it for me. Um, But I thought that it was an important topic of the year and I thought that they handled it very well. What topic is that? About women who are raped and completely left and, you know, no one knows what happened to them. It's not... Um, yeah, just com- like, it's just, well, it, it, it's, it's, it's a topic that has come up a lot lately and this specific woman group evidently has this happen a lot and doesn't get a lot of, um, closure to the cases. And so I thought that that was important for people to know. And I thought that they handled a situation that was very heavy in a very tasteful way. And sometimes that's not done. And I think seeing how it affected the mom and the dad and the Jeremy Renner's character, who, how he is still dealing with the fact that his daughter is gone. I just thought every way that a situation doesn't necessarily get the afterthought explored of how it affects them in the long term was Mm -hmm. handled very well. No, I, I completely agree with you. I think, you know, how often are movies made about Native Americans and the, the things that modern day Native Americans suffer through? And then how often are movies made about like 
like this this topic that that we are kind of uncomfortable with and you take these two things together and you make this movie that that is like it's it's a tough movie to watch it really is but i think i think it is important i think it's fantastically well done i love taylor sheridan i like everything he does i know michael can't stand him but um i love how he writes i love how he builds tension in scenes this was his directorial debut i think this is the first time he actually directed and i thought he did a, a wonderful job and I, I i don't know i just he's great he's great yeah i, I just i just don't enjoy his movies at all because it, they're they're all just like consistently bleak and and it I, I feel like his philosophy is very much like um humans are terrible life sucks and then we die and i i don't really want to be reminded of that i think his 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 um his output is humans are terrible life sucks but we find a way to 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 push to, through to, it to get by in misery well i i <laughs> I don't think that they're, I mean, you might be miserable, but it doesn't mean that you have to end in misery, you know? And I think that part of what makes life great is that you have those times where you are miserable and so that you can work yourself through it and come out stronger. Because I think that the dad of the girl who was found from the beginning of the movie, he, at the very end, was very different than the middle of how he was so upset and you know yeah the guy was gone gotten rid of killed whatever (laughs) but you know i think he dealt with it in a different way and i think that i think it's important for people to see how real it is for someone to go through misery or through any sort of hardship, yeah. you know, and yeah, I think- because because uh, the honest truth is that life is is hard, and sometimes terrible shit happens, and you have to find a way through it. You have to, and you, there's really no other choice. And I think that's what that's what Tyler Sheridan's movies are about. I guess I guess the the failing for me is that I don't really feel the part of it, which is um, like showing how the characters get through it. To me, it seems like they they don't get through it, like it. It, it's 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 something that is going to kind of hold them back forever. Um, and, and, and I didn't really see the extremely dark ending of him, like taking the the rapist into the woods and 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 taking off his shoes. And like, I don't remember exactly what happened, but he just tell him like he had to find his way home. And then he yeah, he just made him walk died. across the wilderness yeah. like he, he did. Yeah, the little, exactly. The what she did. Yeah, it, it, it seemed um, kind of. It, I don't know. It, it, it wasn't. It, it wasn't like an uplifting way to get over it to me. So much as a as a vindictive cycle of people being cruel to each other over and over. Uh, yeah, but that's not how the movie ends. The movie ends with him sitting down with the father of the the girl who was was murdered and helping him through it. Like he's suicidal. And we th- we think for a moment at the end of the movie that he has taken his own life, but he hasn't. And he sits down and talks with him and, and sits with him and helps him. And it's this moment of, you know, we all go through miserable stuff, but we can come together and support each other through it. Yeah. And, and that, that was a good scene. I, I, I guess I just didn't think it was that critical to the storyline because that character was really sort of a tertiary character to what was going on. The father of the girl. Yeah, but I think his his reaching out and helping Jeremy Renner's reaching out and helping him is reflective of Jeremy Renner's wanting oh, of someone to have done that for him right. because he's going through the exact same thing. Right. And right. so right. that's exactly how Jeremy Renner is going to be able to get over yeah. eventually better the loss of his daughter, knowing that he was able to help yeah. her friend. I, yeah, yeah, that that's that's Wind River. Um, it was great. I, I love how, how Taylor Sheridan shot the wilderness. I love how he made it both beautiful and terrifying all at the same time. Um, I just, I, you're absolutely right, Elise, that this is a movie that I, I, I'm bummed. If, if you haven't seen this movie, I wish you would have seen it in the theater. Cause... And if you can't see it in the theater, see it in 4K. <laughs> right. <laughs> Do we own the I 4K? Guess... I think we just own the Blu-ray. Yeah. Oh, man, they didn't make it in 4K. They didn't. You can't even Wait. see it in 4K. <laughs> 
Wait, Blu-rays aren't 4K? No. Not all of them. Blu-rays are Wait. 1080p. What's a... Uh, what's a 4K? It's 4... 4K. Is there a new format for that? Yeah. Huh. You gotta get a new TV, gotta get a new player, yeah. gotta buy all yeah. new movies again. Do they, do, they, do they still sell DVDs? Yes. Interesting. No VHS anymore. No. No? Yeah, those are gone. Huh. All right. Mm-hmm. My number four is Get Out, but that's also on uh, Elise's list, so I think we'll hold off talking about that movie until Elise gets to it. So let's go yeah. back up to Michael Fine. and let's talk about your number three movie, Michael. My number three movie, um, which we've had an episode about before, yes. is Logan Lucky, which was a great um, southern heist caper. Which was both humorous and uh, and 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 fun, and had really enjoyable characters and an enjoyable sort of world, which was our world, but also kind of this weird other world of the film. Yeah, yeah, I think Steven Soderbergh likes to do that a lot, right? Where it's like it's it's where we live, but also kind of not. Right. Um, I'm so glad we don't live there. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, um, right. I mean, me too, I guess, but <laughs> but it was an awesome movie. Yeah. And and I think we talked at length on that podcast about all of the reasons it was successful. Yeah, yeah. I I completely agree. Um did you like it better than would you say it's better than his Oceans movie? Oceans 11? Um I don't know. I I I didn't see those in theaters. I have just seen them on TV and I wasn't even paying attention to them. So ah, they're kind of okay. movies that I saw being played on TV while doing something else. So I, I can't really compare them fairly, but I suspect I would have liked it better just because um, it's, it's a more interesting sort of premise. Yeah. And there's one uh, thing, there's one thing oceans 11 doesn't have and that's Channing Tatum. Road, that's, <laughs> take me home or, or that song to the place. There's another copyright flag. It's, God, the people are going to be what? Fighting That's me over this singing podcast. it though. Is that okay? Yeah. It's not it, the other one was not me. I'm sorry. Or but was it? We can dissect that song at the end of this if we really need to it's do that. Gonna, Is it's that going to help? Matter. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's Logan Lucky. Elise, how about your yeah. number three? So my number three is a movie that I thought was going to be really scary and I almost didn't let you take me to go see it. (laughs) And then I ended up really, really enjoying it. And it was get out, get out, get out directed and get out by Jordan Peele. Yeah. It was really funny. Um, why did you like get out? Oh, my favorite part. (laughs) I agree. Watching movies in the theater. I don't know why box offices are losing money because it's so much more fun going and seeing it. Especially when people <laughs> do what they're really not supposed to do and they, they talk during it. And I guess I can't say what I'm going to say because I don't want to spoil it. Can I spoil it? Will that spoil it? Just say it. It's fine. Spoilers. Spoilers. Spoilers, for get out. Spoilers here. Anyways, so whenever I say Allison, because I think that's her real name, Allison's character in the movie reveals herself as actually being the one that lures the men in. This guy next to us just yells, Marnie, you bitch. <laughs> and it was just perfect. And I think that you've shared that before, but it was just uh-huh. like, it made my heart so warm. We were like, I hate Marnie. I really hate her <laughs> just in general. I think this actress, it's just, it's like her and Kara Knightley. It's just something with their mouth. I just, I don't what? get it. I, that's another subject. But anyways, so I it's liked the movie. Julia it's, Roberts in her mouth. Julia Roberts. Yeah. But for a different reason. Okay. Kira Knightley and Allison, I can't think of her last name right now. They've got that same Williams. thing. Allison Williams, yeah. I'll I'll have to show you later. But anyways. <laughs> so I liked it. It's not what I had thought it was going to be, and I think that was one of the reasons. Um it had light, subtle, tasteful humor <laughs> throughout it. What are you I don't know. <laughs> I haven't seen it in a while. It's it's a very it's a but I really really liked it. Yeah, this was my number four. 
Um, and I, I love Jordan Peele. I think I miss Key and Peele. And I think that one of the cool things about Key and Peele was that the sketches always had like a cinematic quality to them. And I think that translates in this perfectly. This is, this is a, a horror film. Um, it, it has some scary parts in it. It but is not so scary that a person who doesn't like scary movies won't go exactly. see it like me. So if you're out there and you're like, I don't like scary movies. I don't want to go see it. Then don't go see it, but go see Get Out. It's okay. Yeah. It's, it's not that scary. It is very funny. It's very funny. And I, I, of course, the, you can't talk about Get Out without talking about the the commentary the it's TSA. making. The, <laughs> the, uh, what it's showing about racism in our country and what it's kind of specifically attacking a certain type of racism that exists in, you know, America? typically, what, but specifically like, like left leaning upper middle class white people that would call themselves like allies and call themselves not racist, but have, but still at the end of the day are, are otherizing people of color. And it, it sets its sights on those people and it is unapologetic. And I think it's, I think it's really great. I think it's a fantastic piece of filmmaking. Did you see it, Michael? I did see it. I saw it um, just last week, actually. So it it? was much later than most people and and i and i watched it because um it was available on streams and um and it was like an everyone's number one of their top 10 list for the year so mm-hmm. i was like oh, i need to, need to see this but i didn't i, I guess it's maybe because i didn't watch it with scott but i didn't think it was that funny what um, to, yeah i i didn't laugh um i i do like um key and peel i think the most genius thing they ever did was uh their steve urkel sketch not the substitute teacher that. i like <laughs> I substitute seen the Steve teacher. One, yeah <laughs> yeah that, that's brilliant they've done a lot of really good skits but yeah i didn't i didn't think this movie i didn't even think this movie was trying to be that funny except I for was, um i mean there was kind of a skit stick character i think it was more of like um, i think it's funny that he knows that these stereotypes are being made and i see that these are being right. made and then he like that's not that that's funny, but it's just like, oh my gosh, you don't well, realize thought, it. And then it's like, I, whoa. I thought the best parts about the movie is um, it, it kind of effectively showed, um, one, the kind of um, maybe anxieties and, and and situations that might occur when you go visit like a significant other's parents. And on top of that, the um, sort of... Uh, I don't know what you call it, quiet racism or whatever, as you were describing. That yeah. was a that it, it was cool to use that to an exaggerated extent as like a story idea. But where it really fell apart for me was um, was the ending, where to it, to me it's 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 the same kind of lazy Tarantino ending that Tarantino uses in his films that I don't like, which is just like, well, now I don't know what should happen, so the character is going to um, kill everyone brutally and 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 if if that can be made significant um then it can work but but to me it 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 was just kind of well i he needs to get out of the house and i don't know what should happen so he'll just stab someone with the antlers from this thing and then beat this other guy and um and and i just i thought the movie kind of didn't know where to go at the end and fell apart a little bit I will say that the um, the reveal of the TSA guy in the police car was was a good moment, but but other than that, I um, think though that that might have been why they needed to kill everyone because if he had left them alive and then the police car came, you wouldn't have been as like scared for a second because you yeah, yeah. I mean, well, it comes well, and then you're like oh my gosh that. yay because you think police car and then you're like oh my gosh no there's like a the house full that- of people and it's this black guy that comes out and everyone's dead and so depending upon who comes out of that car you're either going to have one of two things happen and so that would have still made that work was um was when the grandpa in the groundskeeper's body um charged him and then he does the camera flash thing which they set up earlier and and brings back the actual person who then um you know turns around and shoots the girl and then shoots himself. And that was kind of well connected to the rest of the movie and and kind of made sense. And that still could have set up the policeman thing. But um, 
I don't know. I just didn't. I, I, I thought it turned into a movie that had from a movie that had something to say into a movie that was just trying to like have like a vague um, kind of thrilly escape at the end. Uh, um, and, then, and I mean, that, that's my personal. Yeah. I, kind of fell apart for me. I think the movie does better than any film I've seen of getting you into the head of the person of color experience in this country. And I think the, the, that ending moment of, in any other horror movie, when you see flash, flashing police lights, it's a moment of, oh, thank God. And in this movie, you're so far into the, that guy's head that you realize, oh, shit, he's fucked now. And that, like, that is the entire movie in, in microcosm there. And I loved, I loved that. I loved that at the end. You're like, oh, he's screwed. The, the police are here now. They are never going to believe him. And I thought that was, I thought that was so great. Do you want to take a moment to thank the TSA for their service? <laughs> oh, yes. Thank you, TSA. Ugh, terrible. Anyway, um, my number three is Ladybird. Well, we need to move on, at least. I'm trying to keep it going. Um, my number three is Ladybird, but once again, that that is further you down. You talk about it now. Talk about it. That's fine. No, it's your it's your number one. <laughs> no, I'm gonna, we're gonna oh, talk no. about it when you, we don't want to other save, things. Save the number one. Yeah, I think we should save the number one. So oh, we'll move right back Spoiler. up to Michael. Spoiler: Lady Bird is someone else's number one. <laughs> what? No, <laughs> Michael, um, I didn't know you liked it that much. I don't think he's seen it. <laughs> yes, he has. I this is favorite I did movie, want to see it, 2018 just, and 2019. That's a it's what a opportunity, Michael? What is your number two? Oh, My number two is seconds. another movie we've had a podcast about, which is Baby Driver. Great movie. Yeah, I don't know how much more we have to say about that, considering we did a whole podcast about it. But yeah, it was just um, stylish. Uh, every scene was very purposeful in its construction and its contribution to the overall story, which I really appreciate. Mm -hmm. You can it still watch it after what you found out. Yeah. Did, did, did Has that the Kevin Spacey stuff changed? No, I, I don't really. Um, I don't know. I don't really conflate the actor with the I've already forgotten. Uh -huh. I'd already forgotten about Kevin Spacey before you just reminded me. So uh, thanks for I'm that. sorry. Sorry. But um, yeah, that, that will probably hurt this movie's. I don't know. Uh, Which I is guess sad. Deal, but because um, it was a really good movie. Yeah, it still is a good movie. Yeah, but yeah, oh, yeah I guess Kevin it still is. Spacey. Was yes. yeah. Kevin Spacey sucks. Baby Driver still good. Can be. Yeah. All right, Elise, you're number two. My number two. Okay, so I, I really liked this movie because of the way that the family dynamic played together. So in The Big Sick, Ray Romano was like the perfect way to play a father. <laughs> I loved how um, Zoe, I can't think of her last name, her character was, I just think um, that like that was an organic love story that I appreciated and I thought it was just, it was happy. It was nice. It's a movie I would watch over and over again. And so that's why I chose it for my number two. How about Holly it was Hunter? Funny. Oh yeah. Holly Hunter. She was funny. I liked her. Yeah. The big sick. Uh, it's a, it's Did really you talk about that already in another thing. What? The big the sick. Movie? Yeah. Um, I probably brought it up once or twice in a, what we've been watching, but no, I don't think we've ever talked about it. Um, yeah, this is this is written written by Kamal Nanjiani and Emily Gordon, who it's it's about their relationship and it's about um, uh, cultural issues. It's about parent issues. It's about relationships. It's funny. It has the best nine eleven joke ever. Yeah, ever. It was um, really funny. Like I don't think there's been a lot of good romantic comedies lately. And I think The Big Sick is one of the best romantic comedies I've ever seen. It's really good. I, uh, I didn't get a chance to see it. I, I almost it, it is available to stream. I almost watched it uh, in the last few days oh, since I knew we were going to be doing this, and I needed to find another movie I liked. Um, but I just, I just like kept seeing the title, and I just kept thinking it was about someone who was just throwing up a lot. <laughs> yeah. Mm, yeah. No. no. Want to watch that movie? Yeah, that's fair. Um, I, I uh, it's such a good movie. I, I don't know what else to say. 
I haven't seen it since we saw it in theater, at least. And we own the movie, and I want to go back and watch it. Maybe we'll do that. We'll after watch we... it tonight. We'll do that. All right, we're gonna watch. The and then set. we'll do a little recap, and then we'll add in why we liked it again. No, we probably won't do that. But <laughs> all right, um, my good. my number two is the Florida Project. This is the Sean Baker written and directed by movie. Um, he did a movie called Tangerine two years ago, last year, um, which is a movie uh, about two um, transgendered prostitutes in LA uh, shot on an iPhone that was one of the most surprising movies that I saw that year. I couldn't believe how good it was. And he's back with the Florida Project, which is a story about this uh, hotel right in, in Florida, right on the edge of Disney World, um, where basically poor people live week to week. And it is a movie that dives into the world of these people in a way that I've never seen before. Um, it, it mostly centers on this this girl and her friends, this little girl. I think she's like five years old. Um, I, I'm trying to remember the name of this person. I'm going to have to look it up. But she is... She was fantastic. She's fantastic. She's a little girl. And she is so much charisma. And some so people charisma. need to take acting lessons from her that yeah. have won Oscars. <laughs> Jennifer yeah. Lawrence. Ooh, ooh. You know how much I hate her. Uh, her name is Brooklyn Prince. Brooklyn. And she played Mooney. And yeah, she's incredible. Um, it, it's so fun because you see like, you, you get to see a, a childlike view of the situation where they're, they're living in this hotel that is kind of like intentionally pretending to be part of Disney World. Like it paints itself pink and looks like a castle to trick people into <laughs> coming to stay here that think they're actually staying at Disney, but they're not. Um, so you see like the magical side of this through the eyes of the kid, but then you jump back to her mother, uh, who is a terrible woman. <laughs> She's a really bad mother. Um, you see Willem Dafoe who plays the manager of this hotel and you see these people just struggling to survive in this world that we don't, we don't get to see in films a lot. There's not a lot of like, like deep dive into this kind of existence. Like I didn't know that these hotels existed and that people live here week to week barely scraping by it's it's really all they have and i i just i loved every bit of this movie i think it was absolutely wonderful and sean baker can shoot well on an iphone and give him a real camera and he makes this this beautiful colorful uh sad and happy movie all at the same time i got angry you did in this movie yeah. Her, and like I, angry? I i think i mean rightly so i got angry because of how terrible of a mother this girl who i don't even know how old she was supposed to have been probably like 20 21 like way early 20s shouldn't have had a kid yeah. like royally screwed up her life and is screwing up a kid's life and i'd like there are certain things that i can tolerate but a bad parent is not one yeah. and i just like i got so mad i cried I got, I just, I walked out of the theater and I remember telling Scott, I was like, I'm mad. I'm so frustrated at this character. And like, he did a good job. He made, he did probably what he was supposed to do and wanted to do about showing how awful of a person she was. Yeah. She, she but, actually is a bad mother. I completely agree with you, but she's also kind of a victim of her circumstance. Like there's, they're trapped. They're trapped there. There's, there's nowhere where they can go. There's nothing like she could be a better mother. You're absolutely right. She could, but I mean, I I get she's working with what she's got. Yeah, and I told like I understand that, but and I know it's hard. But in the end, like what they're going through and that whole process of what the kid's going to have to deal with without her mom. But I don't know. There's it was just oh, it was so frustrating <laughs> to me. I was like, you don't even want your kid. It doesn't. I don't feel like you do, and I just. Oh, I got so mad. I got so mad. I'm sorry. Well, that is... It's okay. That is the Florida Project. It's not Watch real. It. Watch it and get mad. Like but, it, but it can be real, and that's why you get mad. Yeah. I think we're going to see that movie again come, come Oscars time. Well, good, because that little girl needs to get some credit. <laughs> she was fantastic. All right, it's time, Michael. Your number one movie of the year. What is it? I'm sure everyone drum is roll. anxious. Can you hear the drum roll? I can. Oh, copyright again. Yeah. Oh, shoot. That's not you. No, no. <laughs> I'm just um, kidding. My number one movie, 2017. Oh, my gosh. Pins is Lego Batman. What? what? Yes. Okay. Lego. Do tell. Yeah. Well, it it's it's a superhero movie, which I hate. You love. 
Of course, it's but, your number one superhero movies. But um, you love Legos the more than superheroes. I liked it is because it's 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 the best interpretation of the Batman character mm. that has ever existed. Ah, oh. Batman's like seventy years of existence, or or however long it's been. This is the only like actual story and and version of this character that is is correct and i was just so impressed with how geniusly they did it in a humorous way and how they incorporated all of the familiar batman characters like robin and um alfred into that story in all of the correct ways that this had to be my number one hey michael you want a shock yes i agree with you that this, this was the best movie of 2017? No, that this was... Oh my gosh! <laughs> no. Two people! <laughs> that this was the best interpretation of Batman that's ever been on the screen. Yeah, I completely it was agree brilliant. With you. I mean, it's not going to get any awards because it's it's um, at least outwardly frivolous. Um, it has some of the same... I don't even want to say mistakes, but like things that's harder for us, our, our generation, to um, kind of... Uh, understand like it, it it moved at a very spastic pace yeah yeah it is and, and like the, the camera was like always moving which i didn't like um but when the camera did like sit still for a second it was really fun as as well to see like batman's kitchen like constructed all out of familiar lego pieces and stuff and um it is really cool visually when they when they hold the camera still long enough. It's just that <laughs> the, it's usually zooming all over the place. Um, and that's my main criticism with its construction. But uh, but in terms of like storytelling um, and and like characters and like weaving everything together, this there was a lot of of thought put into this movie, even though it was just like a spastic kid movie. Yeah, no, I, the Lego movies have been the biggest surprise to me yeah. in recent memory. Um, these movies that on the surface seem like just corporate cash grabs have been these surprisingly heartfelt, right. well thought out, right. well told it's, stories. It's really difficult for me to get past that. And that is another thing that speaks so highly of this movie is that I'm fully aware of how many toys they can sell because of this movie. And and like at the beginning when they have like a million villains from the Batman universe kind of like in the story, um, you can immediately see like, oh, they did this so that they can make toys of all of these things. And I hate that, <laughs> but I still love this movie. <laughs> yeah. Because, because that, that's not all it was. Like it's whoever, the people who made this movie loved what they were doing and did a great job with it. And they just happened to accept money from our corporate overlords to do so. I, but I, I guess. So why do you think they did Legos? I'm just wondering this. I mean, why did they make the Lego movies? No, like why did they choose Legos instead of just creating some other? I think that the, the Batman character from um, the original Lego movie was really popular and they thought, Hey, we can do this and be silly and goofy and funny. And also there's a bunch of Lego um, video games that have been really popular and Lego Batman video game is one of the more popular ones so right and and crucially well i mean uh, superheroes are popular right now in general but um lego has kind of this genius thing in that they license they have like the license for the lego version of all of these characters that they wouldn't own otherwise yeah yeah so they get to use that's and that's why they get to use everything that's why this movie has right they get to use they get to use everything, everything. And, and i think that's going to change in the future because because that was fine when they were just selling Lego toys, because that's kind of an advertisement for the real thing. Right. But uh, now that they're making like movies, like Batman movies that are better than than you know Warner Brothers' Batman movies, yeah, they might not see it the same way. Yeah. No, I I agree. I think there there's going to be some fighting about the rights to those in the future. If you're right. All right, Elise. Yes. Are you ready? We already know what your number one is, but talk to us no, about your number don't. one. No, we don't. No one knows. Oh, okay. Let no, it be a surprise. Knows. Elise, what yeah. could it be? I don't know. What's what? left of this year? Why don't you tell us? Drum roll. <gasps> oh, Elise, your drum roll was way too loud. <laughs> oh, I always do that. <laughs> it's Ladybird. 
Why did you love Greta Gerwig's Lady Bird? I love Greta Gerwig, first of all. I think all of the movies that I have seen that she has done, I've adored. I think she is just a fantastic human being. Um, I really liked the mother-daughter relationship in this movie. Um, As terrible as it was, it made me very, very thankful for my mom. And I do. I went home. Did we see this over Thanksgiving? And then we went to our house for Thanksgiving. I think so. And I, I told my mom, I was like, I saw this movie and it was fantastic, but the mom was awful. And I was so thankful this whole movie that you were not like that. And I was like, you were a great mom. Um, which is the complete opposite of your Florida project. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess the moms were equally not great. I think but... Lori Metcalf's mother in this movie is complicated. I think she I think was. She's and not I think a bad she was, mother. No, she had the very best intentions for her daughter. And I think it's just, it is very hard when you are a teenage girl and you are growing up and you're trying to figure out who you are and what you should do with your life and having a parent in there with you. Um, and I think I probably liked it a lot because I, I identified with that aspect of growing up and that character a lot. Um, and so I just really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the music in it. I enjoyed the entire, just the entire thing. I just loved it. Yeah. It it was great. It's really heartfelt. Like it's, it's a very, it's so Greta Gerwig and I, I, it's hard to explain. Like, it's hard to come up with a different word was, for what that is. It was really is. weird too, because Greta Gerwig was not in it, but she was in it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this and was, was, this was about, she, she wrote this film and it was based loosely on her life. It takes place in the early two thousands when Greta Gerwig herself was a 17 year old and living in California and wanting to move to uh, go to a school on the East coast, just like, the character Lady Bird in the story is so it's very much about Greta Gerwig and and the experiences she had but yeah Saoirse Ronan who is a great actress like nails the the Gerwig mannerisms like manner yeah it's insane like she has such a plucky kind of odd but like she's a mouth thing too yeah you're right but it's like it's it's not the annoying one it's like oh those are her mannerisms that's what yeah. she does and then it's yeah. like oh I'm going to butcher her name. Was it Saoirse? Saoirse. Saoirse. Saoirse did it. Chopped her hair off. Did it. It was like, it was weird. Yeah. They did put her in clothes though that made her look a lot like Greta too. Yeah. Yeah. And it like, I love how fleshed out the world of this movie is. Like every character has a story and and you don't necessarily get to see them all, but you can feel them in the background. Like the the theater teacher. You remember the theater teacher? Mm -hmm. And like he's going through stuff throughout the course of this movie and it's there and you can see it. It's just not front and center. And I, I don't know, like, it's like, I was a teenager at the exact same time that uh, this movie took place. And while I was not a a teenage girl, I went through difficulties with my mother. Um, I, my mom and I had fights and, and butted heads and had a complicated, complicated relationship. And there's a, something like universally, um, appealing about this kind of story and, and and relatable about this kind of story and i just think it's so well done i michael see this movie seriously both of the guys too that were in it this is the other one that had timothy chalet in it and then who's the redheaded Ch- Ch- chalet. chalet whatever he's chalamet. chalamet lucas hedges is the other gotta one correct me it. lucas hedges yeah i just i liked them all they're yeah. so fantastic laurie metcalf is incredible like she's mm-hmm. so good in this movie. I hope she gets a nomination as well. Um, this is this is the movie that has one rotten review on Rotten Tomatoes. Ugh, I bet one. it was from Michael. It was. It was from Michael. <laughs> I didn't see it. I, I think I'd probably like it. I think you maybe. would too. It, 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 it it's. I like I like movies about characters, and it seems like this movie is about characters. Yeah, yeah. And it's like it doesn't. It ends on a good note, um, but it ends very realistically, where like not everything is just magically patched up, but. It's such a uh, ladybird. See ladybird. Mm-hmm. You really do. All right. See it. My number one is Guillermo del Toro's The Shape of Water. What? 
I went back and forth on this a lot, um, but I, I kept coming back to this movie um, because there's just something so wonderfully weird about it that just appeals to me. Um, this is this is the story of a girl falling in love with a fish monster. It's the story of Ruth. Of Ruth? Oh, the Bible story. It's the Bible story yeah. of Ruth. It was plastered on the movie theater thing the whole time. You're right. For you to look at. You're right. Yeah, so this is Sally Hawkins plays a uh, mute woman who works at a government facility where they catch a fish monster and she and the monster end up having a relationship and it's this beautiful weird fairy tale love story um done in in a very Guillermo del Toro style like the the set design is great I think the same uh director of photography that did uh Crimson Peak did this movie and it's just so delightful like I love all the characters in it I love Michael Shannon's government agent that's struggling to to, to succeed even though he's clearly the bad guy I love Richard Jenkins is this this art artistic gay man who is i think this is a, a period piece as well so he's in a world that doesn't really accept him um all these characters are, are in worlds that don't really accept them and and are, are on the outskirts of the world and they find each other and i think that's beautiful it has michael stuhlbarg in it again who plays the uh doctor at this facility that wants to save the alien creature as well um and it's just I love Guillermo del Toro. I love his eye. I love how he tells stories. Um, Pan's Labyrinth, I think, is really, really wonderful. I loved Crimson Peak. I even liked uh, the the giant robot movie. Um, and I, although I'm not looking forward to Pacific Rim too, Pacific, but yeah. yeah, but that's not that's not directed by him. But I don't know. Like, there's something about The Shape of Water that just seems like it was made directly for me, and I love it. Also, you get to see a, a lady, you see a lady fuck a fish, Michael. Um, so I'm sure you've never seen before. Said it before, but, yeah. but I did really want to see this movie. I like, I like uh, fairy tale stories, and um, I like Guillermo del Toro. Pan's Labyrinth is is, is also so one of my favorite movies, probably. Yeah. So, so that is uh, the shape. Of I, I didn't, it didn't get a wide release here anyway. Yeah, no. Yeah. I think uh, check again. No, you're, you're right. It's not. It's not yet. So that's it. That's our top five lists. Um, there were a few movies I didn't get to see that might have made it their way onto this list or not. Um, I really wanted to see Paul Thomas Anderson's Phantom Thread, but that's not out here yet. I really wanted to see Steven Spielberg's The Post, also not out here yet. So I don't know if those would have made it onto my list or not, but I wanted to see those movies. But that, those are our lists. You'll get your chance soon. <laughs> All right. That, that let's Michael. Let's move on to the second annual Golden Planet Awards. Are you excited? I'm so excited. Some of these movies you've seen, some you haven't. So we we've, we've got we've got like I think five awards, ten awards here to give away. Um, some of the same categories we did last year. The first one, Michael, is the best flop of 2017. Now explain is is this the best flop as in? It was still a flop, but this is the best of them. Or is this the best flop? Is in this flopped the hardest? This is the the best movie that flopped. Box office, yes. box flop, office flop, right? Yeah. I guess yeah. it's a box so office no flop. It was a good it, movie, yeah. But you did, but Scott did. Yeah. Well, no, the Daily Planet because <laughs> it's the the Golden Planet Awards. Hey, I didn't have any say in this. Well, you weren't there. <laughs> I'm a daily, <laughs> but I didn't get to pick. Uh, at least you helped me decide the winners. Except for one of these movies that should not have been on there. I hated it. Okay. The best flop of 2017. The nominees are Blade Runner 2049. Beautiful. That's fine. Free Keep Fire. That's it it good. That's fine. Colossal. I watched it three times because I fell asleep yeah. twice. <laughs> Never saw it. Baywatch. Abs on How could fire. How with The Rock fail? I don't, exactly. And Zac Efron. And Adriana five, Daddario. Mother. That one, glad it flopped. <laughs> the most controversial movie. movie that The up worst until, movie of 2017. Until, right there. Up until a couple of days ago, was on my top five list, but I ended up taking it off at the end. I, I, I think um, Aaron... Uh, what's his name? Darren Aronofsky. Aronofsky. Yeah. Darren Aronofsky, that's right. He was a director that I really liked, and but just with each movie he makes now, I, I, I think I realized I was wrong. No, you're, you're totally right. He's great. I'm right. Oh, okay. 
he was he's for, great. He's a great me. director. Anyway, the the winner of the best flap of 2017 goes to. I'm opening, the, I'm opening the envelope. There's no envelope. There's, oh wait, no, I don't right want Mother to win because right it wasn't the best flap. Sound effects. It's all sound effects. Colossal. Baywatch by Nacho Vigalando. Um, this is a, a small, tiny movie that flopped because because at least no fell one asleep twice. Heard of it? Yeah. Um, this was a movie I saw at Fantastic Fest in 2016, and then came out last year. Um, it is a movie starring Anne Hathaway. I think we talked about it last year a little bit, but I really loved this movie. I think it's it has a powerful message about alcoholism and and toxic masculinity and internet culture and all these things, and has giant monsters in it. It's so good. Everyone needs to go see Colossal. I don't like Anne Hathaway, and I liked Anne Hathaway in this. So that, so that, that tells you something. Anne Hathaway, the one from the Pitch Perfect movies? No, no. she's from Princess Diaries. We had the Diaries. same conversation we were seeing <laughs> Jumanji. I've already forgotten. That's <laughs> okay. how important Scott's things are to you. Oh, it hurts my feelings. It's okay. I anyway, can identify. The next category is the Franchise Killer Award, also known as the Terminator Genesis Award, because... <laughs> Congratulations. Apparently, yeah. they're going to make another Terminator movie now, though, so we might no, have to rename not. this. Maybe not. All right. So the nominees here are The Mummy, oh, which God. single-handedly killed the, the whole dark awful. universe. That was yeah. awful. Justice League. Yeah. The, okay. the Dark Tower. Yeah. Uh, Transformers The Last Night, which was the lowest performing Transformers really never understood how those movies have always performed well but they have until this one overseas yeah they have and then finally ridley scott's alien covenant a movie that a lot of people i know liked but i think is terrible and and performed really badly and might mean the death of of the alien franchise which i think is oh. probably a good thing who won this category scott the winner is just gonna break I, no matter who wins in this category we lose <laughs> Well, no, because th see, these movies killed their franchises. Yeah, well, Some you say of that. Them I don't think have. Guys, I'm breaking the seal on the envelope right now. Okay, break the seal on the envelope. And the winner is. So I gave it to Justice League, um, because Justice League performed so badly, and I don't think Justice League is going to kill the DC extended well, universe. It's not franchise killer. But I think the Justice League is going to seriously s halt every single plan in the DC extended universe and cause them to rethink and reshape everything. These properties are too valuable for them to just give up, but it is going to, it, it, it is going to end the DC extended universe as we know it. You know what they I should do like... is make them all Lego movies. <laughs> they should make, they should definitely make them all Lego movies. <laughs> I think that might but, help. Um, but I mean, I feel like this is set after every DC movie. Yeah. But like, like but the thing, like it, it, the thing was man of steel, wasn't great but performed okay batman vs superman was disappointing but still did okay um wonder woman was a huge hit so everyone's like oh look they're turning it around and then this movie came out and just like like i it, mean it's still in the top 10 high scores movies of the yeah year, but it's though. going to but lose Jumanji's money kind of it, it, it had it. it had to make 750 million dollars worldwide to break even it is going to be about 100 million dollars short of that so this is this is a disaster for DC. Um, this was supposed to be their flagship movie, and they they they're gonna have to change. Like they're just gonna have to rethink and retool. And I, that's good because I think they should. You I know, you should. say you you say that jokingly, but they should they should make it all Lego. Because, because <laughs> no, that's, yeah, seriously, that's different. That's that's right now they're competing with Marvel, and and they need to like they can't compete. Keep yeah, Wonder Woman how she is. They can do that, but yeah. but but as a as far as the universe goes, like they already have something successful with with Lego superhero movies, mm -hmm. um, and and they even had like Superman in that movie. Yeah. I think I think they're still gonna make those <laughs> can Lego movies. We copyright this idea so we can bank on it right now. No. Because that could be our big break, guys. Guys, they're going to keep making the Lego superhero movies. That we doesn't are mean the they're Daily not... Planet Productions. We are doing Lego movies. That doesn't mean yeah. they're not going to keep making the live action movies. There's too much money there. It's okay. We'll make ours better. I think we should we should branch off and have our Lego movies be like really 
somber and dramatic. I don't think we have the licensing oh, that's a to good idea. do that. Yeah, well, we wouldn't call it the Lego movie, but we could use the Legos as stop motion what's figurines. The Lego, what's the Lego um, competition? Like the, that, It's basically Lego, uh, but a different company. Is there competition for Lego? Yeah, there's I thought like, Lego was the only respected built block company. No, there's other building box companies that are just mine? not that popular. Duplo? What's that mine? Yeah, what's the, the Duplo oh, Expanded no, Universe? What is the... <laughs> Duplo. <laughs> no, that game that all the kids are playing, the blocks. Minecraft? Minecraft. What about oh, they made a what Minecraft about... movie? They're already doing oh, that. Are they, they are really? Good. Yeah. That's a bummer. <laughs> all right, the next category is sequels that should have should not have happened. These are all movies. Of them, all of them shouldn't have happened. <laughs> These are movies that like it's been forever since the sequel or, or since the original or the original didn't even make any money or like there's just there's just no reason why they should have made this movie, and the nominees are Rings, the third <laughs> movie in the Ring universe that nobody was asking for, um, Pirates of the Caribbean: Dead Man Tell No Tales, the fifth Pirates movie that I don't think anyone cared about at all. Um, just won't let it die. Jigsaw, the eighth movie in the Saw franchise that ended almost ten years ago that no one was asking for more of. Cars three. Um, a movie that was literally just made for toys and, and no other reason. And Jumanji, Michael's movie, Welcome to the Jungle, a sequel to a movie that uh, did people even like? Did people even really like Jumanji? I, I don't feel like it was a massive success the first time. And, no. and I agree that the sequel shouldn't have been made. But, yeah. but, the sequel. but that's why it's such a miracle. That it was no, I completely good. agree with you. And that's why it did not win this category because the winner is spoiler alert pirates of the caribbean dead men tell no tales i think that this movie was just made because johnny depp had to do like some bankruptcy stuff and so he (laughs) needed to get money for something and so they had to make a movie so they could pay him so he could pay off that what was it australia right didn't he when he had to take his dogs in it cost them so much money yeah yeah and then you know he had to get divorced because he because he beats his wife. Yeah, I'm real tired of Johnny Depp. Yeah, I think the world is tired of Johnny Depp. The best mm-hmm. part of Murder on the Orient Express is that Johnny Depp dies 20 minutes into it. Uh, <laughs> spoiler. He's the victim. It's well, not maybe Michael didn't know that. He's seen the movie. I, he, it's oh, a train yeah. movie. He He's loved it. it. But, I, I forgot. but I didn't know that before I saw the movie. Yeah, but it so. would not have ruined now, the movie. Now, if you had known Johnny Depp was going to die, would you have seen it sooner than you had originally <laughs> seen it? I Perhaps, but, but if I'd known Johnny Depp was in the movie, then I might not have seen it at all. Uh, yeah, that's true. That's yeah, Harry Potter franchise. Get Johnny Depp the fuck out of your movies. Mm-hmm. It is amazing that... that Despite his um, actually like verified spousal abuse, he has seen no repercussions from this whole, yeah, like scandal climate. Yeah, and and J.K. Rowling came to his defense on Twitter for some stupid reason. I don't understand. I, I don't get it. I really don't get it. I think it's. I mean, I get it. It's because internationally Johnny Depp is still hugely popular outside of America, and so oh, and in America, but I think. Most people, I think, not as in America, not as much. I don't think. I mean, if no. we're gonna go back to, I guess he didn't hit his wife. That was just infidelity. Never did mind. He? No, he did. He no, abused... I'm I'm going off of something yeah. else. I was oh. gonna go to someone else. Oh, okay. It's okay. I won't go there. Johnny Depp, bad man. Yes, bad, yes. bad man. All right, now we have the special, the special award, the most likely to watch hungover on a Saturday morning on TBS, aka the James Gentry Achievement Award. Um, this is an award that that podcast guest and and friend of daily planet james gentry gives out every year um he picked this one so this is not my decision this is what james picked are you gonna read through the nominees yeah the nominees are and the nominees are pirates five wait what what pirates of the caribbean dead men oh, Tell pirates no of the caribbean. Yes, okay yes. Like, wait there was another no no just movies came out justice league transformers five the last night uh, the dark tower and the Lego Batman movie. And this is so the, the the background of this category for people that have never listened to this podcast before. Uh, James Gentry was one of my friends and roommates all throughout college. And he loved to like spend his hungover Saturday mornings watching random, mostly bad movies on TBS with like that take three hours because they have so many damn commercials in them. Except for one of those on there. 
It's not necessarily a... I said mostly, I'm Beth. Just, I'm just saying. Um, so th- James Richie just loves doing that. And, and you walk into his room and he's watching, like, some stupid movie like that he's seen 500 times. And he goes, James, why are you watching this? I don't know. Um, so I sent these these nominees to James and I told him to pick the one that he is most likely to watch. And he picked... The Dark Tower, the uh, first movie in what was supposed to be a Stephen King universe that bombed so bad and was a really, really awful movie. And this is coming from a person who loves Stephen King and and the Dark Tower series is one of my favorite series of books. Um, It was a terrible movie, but I completely believe that James Gentry will watch this on TBS in two years. (laughs) I completely believe it. So there's your James Gentry Award. Congratulations, Dark Tower. Yeah. All right. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> I don't know. All right. Creepiest CGI, aka the Scorpion King Award. Michael, would you would you like to read the nominees on this one? Sure, I'll read the nominees. All right. And the nominees are Pennywise from the movie It. Henry Cavill's weird ass lip from Justice League, Mm. The Beast from Beauty and the Beast, Steppenwolf, also from Justice League, and finally, Army Hammer's Balls, (laughs) Call Me By Your Name. So the story on that one is they had to CGI out Army Hammer's balls because he was wearing really short shorts. And when he sat down, I mean, they were short, his balls would show. So they had to CGI it in the way. And I feel like that's creepy enough that it it warrants. It's a creepy idea. Was it obvious when you were watching the film? Uh, you yeah. were like, man, this guy's shorts are way short. Like, it wasn't obvious. That the, the CGI was not obvious, but I was like, man, you you should probably be able to see his balls the way he's sitting in those short shorts. So, uh, the CGI is not noticeable, but the fact that they did it is... It was weird. And the winner, Michael, what is the winner? You want me to do the envelope for you, and then you can read it? Do the envelope for me, right. and then I read it. The ruins... What? You mean there's not real envelopes? No, it totally... <laughs> what? Here, let me just, I'm just going to send the envelope to you through the internet. Here we go. Okay. Willy Wonka style. All right, it's, okay. it's coming over, so now I'm you op- can open it. I'm open. It. I'm open. It. Okay. Okay, the winner is Henry Cavill's Weird Ass Lip. Of course it is. How can it not be? That was, you haven't seen the movie, right, Michael? No, on no. purpose. So yeah, the, the, the story here, if anyone somehow doesn't know it, is that Henry Cavill was filming a movie that required him to have a mustache and he needed to come back and shoot some more scenes for justice league. And the production company he was on, like told him, no, you cannot shave the mustache. Even though WB offered to pay that company the money to digitally put the mustache back on, which would have been way cheaper, cheaper than digitally removing it on justice league. They turned him down. They said, no. So he had, they had to digitally remove the mustache in post and it looks so bad there are pictures of it all over the internet you can look it up it's creepy and uncomfortable and weird and it takes what is already a a, a rough movie and just makes it worse yeah it's pretty bad I thought pennywise was pretty good um yeah there were parts of him that were and then there were parts that i thought were obvious cgi and yeah. showed the limitations of the budget they have hmm What's I wanted to put thing? something else on there, but it wasn't uh, really movie. What, what? Oh yeah, the. Uh, I wanted to put the Walking Dead. Yeah, the Walking Dead CGI. Man, that lion. Yeah. Not the lion, the tiger. The tiger and bears. Oh my! But which is just like uh, we still watch the Walking Dead, which is no, a we shock don't anymore. Spread. Yeah, we, I have quit. You I, still watch I can't. The no, I have not watched it for the past couple episodes. I'm just tired of it. Okay. And if I'm tired of it. Okay. I'm saying something. All right, two more categories to go, Michael. What's the next one? The worst movie of 2017. The worst one. What? There were no bad movies last year. We don't we don't like negativity, but every once in a while we just have to have a category like this. I like so I think I, just, I think I know it's going to win this one. That's cuz you can see it on the oh, screen. Where's the last oh. Jedi? Oh, that was a really bad one. That was a real bad one. Oh, I can't even believe that was made. That should have been the, the franchise killer award. The nominees are Bright the Will Smith uh, orc buddy cop movie that came out on Netflix over the holidays, the book of Henry, uh, the movie that got um, 
Colin Trevorrow kicked off of Star Wars Episode Nine, The Dark Tower, which we've already talked about, downsizing mm. a such a terrible, disappointing movie, and The Snowman, a murder mystery story taking place in Norway that is one of the messiest, weirdest, most uncomfortable films I've ever what, seen. What is, what is the Book of Henry story that I you you teased but didn't explain? Uh, He's such a tease. Wh- what is the story of the movie? When someone got kicked off of Star Wars? Yeah, Colin Trevorrow directed The Book of Henry, and it was so bad, it was received so negatively, and it bombed so hardly that uh, he was asked to not direct Star Wars Episode Nine. <laughs> oh. I mean, that's, like, Disney claims that was not why, but it was. But it was. It was, totally it was why. why. Yeah. It was definitely why. Okay. It, is, it is a mess of a movie. It is incredibly bad. Um, but the winner for the worst movie of 2017 is... Mother. That wasn't Star Wars. No. It was bright. Star Wars. It was the Max Landis yeah. written. It wasn't as bad as Star Wars. That's you haven't even seen it. <laughs> Fair. Even if you didn't like Star Wars, calling it the worst movie of the year is absurd. Bright um, is the David Ayer. Ayer, Ayer, Ayer what? Why can I talk Ayer. today? David Ayer directed, Max Landis written, Netflix movie, Netflix's first blockbuster film. Guys, this movie is a mess. Not Netflix's first bomb. This movie is a absolute mess. It is tonally all over the place. It is completely tone deaf. It is supposed to be this metaphor. Like, it's using... Like, so the, the concept of the movie is Lord of the Rings stuff happened, and now it's 2,000 years later, and, like, races are representation of different classes in America. So, um, the orcs are the poor underclass black people, um, the elves are the rich 1% upper class, and then there's everyone else in the middle, and Will Smith plays a cop who's forced to partner up with an orc, who's the first orc on the force, and that's an interesting setup for a movie, but it just it's just executed so terribly. Like, the inciting incident of this movie happens 35 minutes into it, so, like, nothing happens for a while, and then suddenly there's this magic wand that apparently will bring back the Dark Lord or something. And this is still also supposed to be a metaphor for racism and classism. And it just doesn't work. It's not really interested in diving into any of the things that it wants to talk about. Will Smith says, fairy lives don't matter today, which is one of the most confusing lines I've ever heard in a movie that's supposed to be talking about racism coming from their black actor. I I don't, I don't understand this movie. I don't understand what they were thinking. It's so terrible and it's dull and cheaply looking like it's just awful. It's bad. And it's the worst movie of 2017. Some might say. So Michael, don't like, I know I've just piqued your curiosity. Don't go watch this movie now. I won't. Good. Now let's get positive again. (laughs) The best movie of 2017 Elise, do you have the nominations in front of you? Do you want to? Oh, read these? I get to do the best movie. Yeah. Oh, that's quite the responsibility. Okay. And the nominees for the best movie of 2017 Golden Planet Awards are Get Out, Lady Bird, The Big Sick, Lego Batman Movie, and. <laughs> the Shape of Water and the 2017 Best Movie of the Year is Lady Bird <gasps> by Greta Gerwig. Oh my god. Oh, and the crowd goes wild, and Elise actually knew what the best movie was because she picked it. <laughs> oh no, not like because I picked it the winner, but like it was my number one and it was the best movie. And I didn't pick it. Yeah, well, uh, the way I uh, the way I did this, if you can't, if you didn't notice by the nominees, is I took um, movies that we all seem to like. So that's why Lego Batman movie was on there for you, Michael, because that was your number mm-hmm. one. Uh, and I picked all of our number ones, and then I picked some others that appeared on our list the most. And the ones that appeared on the list the most times at the lowest numbers was the winner, oh. and that was Lady Bird. So congratulations, yeah. Lady Bird! You were Good the best job, movie Lady of Bird. 2017, according to the Daily Planet, which is official and formal and irrevocable Irrevocable. it will be written in stone (laughs) it has been done scott i think we should get the best movies tattooed 
on you. That's a really bad idea. I think we'll just keep a list, like going down your back from last year. Okay, well, 2016 was Arrival. So we'll get Arrival and now Lady Bird. What's it going to be next year? We don't even know. I don't know. We don't even know. I like that both of those movies, though, were strong female women. Way to go. (laughs) Strong female women? Strong female women in the lead. Strong female women. (laughs) Shut up. All right, that's all we have for the podcast this week. Uh, that's 2017. We we wrapped it up. It's done. Now we're looking only forward to the future. And as Michael said, we are relentlessly positive. 2018 is going to be a great year. It's going to be a great year for movies. movies. I I can't wait to Except see what we get. On solo, maybe. That's, yeah. That's okay. Up. Yeah. That's. I right. thought you were going to be positive. Yeah, Michael. I'm very positive. But I thought that so positivity I, was that going to be irresponsible. Exude. I am positive that the Han Solo movie is going to be a piece Don't of Don't you shit. pull that little piece of a joke. Uh-uh. <laughs> Elise is getting <laughs> sassy. All right, let's wrap this thing up. Elise, thanks for coming on to the show. Uh, do you have a show that you want to plug, Elise, that maybe started just recently? Mm, I mean, I've been watching this one show. No, I mean... I like, know what the, you mean. <laughs> We'll plug plug it. So I got this show, Michael. It's called Vow to View. I've heard of that. You have. And What's it about, Elise? It's basically a way for Scott to make me watch all these really bad movies. What? And for me to let him watch all these really good movies. I don't like this. And tone. so, you know, it's about when you get married or you're in a relationship, you got to watch what the other person used to watch. Sometimes they're bad. Sometimes <laughs> you, they're good. Did, did you design this um, graphic for the bout of you? No. We paid, we paid someone to do it. I did not. Oh, did you? Yeah. Uh, I had the okay. inspiration. Yeah. At least, at least did the general yeah. design. Oh, yeah. You know, it's anything cool. creative is pretty much me. <laughs> anything that you would like right. from the Daily Planet podcast is pretty much <sighs> I'm never inviting you on this bit episode again this is a terrible idea I pretty much give Scott all of his good ideas <laughs> so, so what, were the, what are the movies in the first bout of you? Yeah, at least you're not doing a good job playing oh. this at all one of them, I so was we there. watched The Music Man and so if you'd like to hear me sing you can definitely listen to that podcast I do an expert job of recreating all of the original songs in my own voice. And then Scott made me watch Gattaca. Which is a great movie. But I'm not going to do any more talking about it, because if they really want to hear me talk about it, uh, you absolutely. listen to me there. Yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. That's out now. So if you liked Gattaca and you want to hear what I think about it, then go listen now. Vow to view. We have a really good intro. We do. We, we spend a lot of time on an we intro. We spend a lot of time. Our last day of vacation before we go back to work. We spent most of it. We used a light metronome and everything. It was crazy. Talking about musicality. (laughs) All right. Thanks, Elise. Michael. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) I don't have anything else. I was like, what does Michael have? No, no, you have. um, What does Michael have to offer? What does Michael have? (laughs) Michael has so called writers with Matt, which has been on hiatus as Matt struggles to get internet again on hiatus yeah that show is going to come back for those we had some people asking us what happened uh so-called like writers is Michael. going to come back and you just have to wait till matt gets internet which is we don't know when that's gonna be but that's all we got for you guys this week i think we're gonna be back next week um i don't know what we're gonna do just yet i'm not planned for january yet but uh we will be back next week with another great show and uh we'll, we'll see you guys next time <laughs>